like you can quit whenever you want to. Yes. Like you can go for a year and if you decide this is not for me, I want to go on medical leave or I just want to quit altogether, that is completely fine. Like something I wish I could go back and tell like my 13, 14 year old self is like, just because you started something difficult doesn't mean that you always have to see it through. There's no reason to put yourself through so much unnecessary pain or success. If you're meant to do something, it will find its way back to you. Hello, Andy. <laughs> Hi, nice to see you all. Yeah, well, I didn't know that you were in Cambridge, so um, yeah, this is exciting. It's been a few years. I've been here working. Uh, a lot of my friends from college ended up in the area, actually, so it's Love nice it. to have them. And yeah, thanks for having me on this podcast. Yeah. It's my first time on a podcast. Yeah, and this is also our first time recording this uh, you know, on video as well, so um, say hi to all of our listeners. Um, yeah, so I mean, this is this is Thomas's setup. It's it's I mean I've, I've you know sung praises on you know Thomas's interior design skills. Uh, we you guys these guys only get to see this part of the room, but it's it's truly beautiful. Um, well, Andy, how long have you been in Cambridge for? Ooh, that's kind of a long-winded story. Uh, in total, I'd say about ten years. Uh, more recently, like three-ish years. Got it, got it. Yeah. Oh, it's so fun. Well, uh, we should also let the listeners know like how we know each other. Yeah, so Thomas Kiang and I all went to the same high school. Mm -hmm. um, I am in the grade below them, so the class of 2015. Um, so when I saw that they were doing a podcast and saw that they did an episode on boarding school, yeah. I was like, I need to get in on that. Yeah. So here we are. Love it, love it. Well, thank you for coming on as a guest. Um, I'm actually kind of curious personally, like how you found out about our podcast. Pretty organically. Um, I was on Spotify looking for podcasts to listen to because yeah. I only really listen to like one news podcast and that's about it. Mm -hmm. And then this came up and I saw like the artist's name. I was like, hey, wait a minute. I know yeah. those people. Yeah, Thomas and Kiyo, yeah. Yeah, and so it was nice. I started listening to your first episode and it was like, just like meeting an old friend. It was very comforting and very nice. And yeah. I was like, yeah, I would like to continue listening to you. Yeah, I think that's what we sort of index on a lot trying to make this conversational as, and as friendly as possible. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and also we're sharing a mic because our setup <laughs> only has two microphones at the moment. Uh, we can scale up eventually, but yeah, Keong and I will be trading off. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I just wanted to echo that and say it's great to reconnect with high school friends. Um, and yeah, I love that we could just make this happen and hopefully it's just like a chill environment where you can share some of your thoughts. And yeah, thanks for listening too because... Um, yeah, you know, we're we're just glad to be able to talk and have people engage and all of that. So um, interested to hear your perspective. Yeah, because I think in our boarding school episode, some of our ep other episodes, you know, we tried to note that we're just offering our own perspectives and That's probably right, yeah. people who have like very different experiences than we do. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, definitely want to avoid saying that what we experienced is, is the default or the norm or anything like that. And, you know, whether your experiences were similar or different or whatever, we just want to hear it, you know, totally, mm -hmm. um, no preconceived notions. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Looking well forward. said Thomas. Okay. So, um, Andy, well, you know, as Thomas said, I mean, the, the purpose of this episode is to bring your perspective into this. So, you know, for the most of this podcast, you know, we will just really want you to just tell us, you know, your perspective on these things. But, um, with that said, let me start off with the first question is, um, tell us a little bit about your life before high school, before Exeter. Um, so where were you born? You know, what school did you go to? Like, you know, Thomas and I talked about this in our episode. Like I went to a public school and Thomas went to, you know, a school in Japan. Like we talked about the transition and stuff like that. So please you know, tell us a little bit. Yeah. If the listeners don't mind listening to this very long story. Uh, I'm about to share. Uh, so it was born. They know what they sign up for. You know, they, they've listened to our episodes, so they did hour long, you know, episode of it at a time. Please, yeah, take it away. Uh, so I was born in Seoul, and when I was one, my parents moved to Boston because my mom was starting to get her master's at the conservatory, and my dad got like a visiting professor job at Harvard in the Asian Studies department. Oh wow. Um, their original plan was to be here for two years while my mom got her master's, but then my sister was born and things just kind of snowballed from there. So I ended up living in Boston, like close to Cambridge, between the ages of like one to nine. So basically all my formative years. And during that time, I don't know how my parents found out about this school. I went to a private day school out in Weston, which I did not 
think about it in any sort of way at the time because I was like eight. Um, <laughs> but looking back, I'm like, wow, okay, I went to school with people who would eventually send, like whose parents would eventually send them to places like Exeter. And so I just want the listeners to know what you're about to hear is not the average American like school experience, nor is it the average Korean school experience. So I did that from ages one to eight, and then it was time for us to move back to Korea. So when we got back to Korea, my sister was sent to an international school, similar to Thomas. Oh, wait, you went to I went, you went to Japanese yeah. school. No, um, no, I went to international. International school. Okay, so similar to Thomas, my sister went to international school because she has a citizenship. Um, and my parents thought it would be a good idea to send me to a Korean, Korean school. Oh, U.S. citizenship, your sister. Got mm -hmm. it, got it. Because you need the U.S. citizenship to go to an international school in Korea, right? Yeah, yeah, at least at the time. I think nowadays the rules have changed a little bit, but it's either you're a U.S. citizen or your parents are diplomats from other countries um, or they're like foreign business owners working in Korea. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I went to Korean school, and at the time I didn't speak a lot of Korean. Like, I spoke it at home with my parents, but I remember not wanting to answer back to them in Korean. So, obviously school was, like, that first year of school was pretty tough. It was a huge transition going from, like, being in a classroom environment where I understood everyone, I was well-liked by my peers, I was well-liked by my teachers, and the classroom environment was very collaborative even at that age, even though we were just learning how to write letters and count blocks. Um, but when I got to Korea, I started wearing a uniform, I had a name tag, I started getting referred to by a number instead of my name, because in a lot of Korean school systems, um, you get a number assigned to you based on like your homeroom and like the alphabetical order of your name. Um, so that was pretty jarring, and on top of that, I, I don't think my classmates knew what to do with me. Like, here was this kid who clearly came from a foreign place, didn't speak a lot of Korean, I behaved very differently from everyone, I like came in with the idea that my teachers would be my friends, so I treated them as such, which was a big no-no at the time. I had some pretty strict teachers who were not fond of that. So, all in all, I didn't fall in line, and the thing about I don't want to make huge generalizations, but I, I think Kiang can attest to this. Especially in Korean society, if you don't fall in line with everyone else, it's very obvious and people can tell yeah, that you're a top liar. Yeah. Um, so that first year in Korea, I got pretty badly bullied. I like didn't make any friends. Mm. Um, but things gradually got better. Um, I started excelling in school. I made good friends and I continued on until the eighth grade in Korea. And then during that time, my older cousin, who is two years older than me, uh, said that she was going to go to a junior boarding school, which is essentially a prep school for prep schools. Um, so she was out in Texas at some school um, at like, age 14. And before that, I didn't even know that was an option. And I had already been fed up and unhappy with learning and being in Korea. So I begged my parents, I was like, please let me go. I would like to leave. The thing is, at the time, my parents were in a uh, bit of a difficult financial situation and they had very differing viewpoints about whether they should let me do this because like, here's this 14 year old who is asking them to go live alone in a foreign country and um, my dad was obviously like, you're 14, like, why would you want to do that? Plus, we don't have money to pay for that right now. And my mom, who had seen my life a little bit more up close, was more open to the idea of me striking out and doing something for myself. I, I, I do not want to interject, but I mean, I am interjecting. I, I would love for you to elaborate a little bit more on why your mom was a big proponent. Like, what do you think of you, uh, like, what side of you do you think your mom picked up on, which made her, you know, think that, oh, it would be good for Andy? Yeah, um, I think my mom always knew that I was more of an independent thinker. I, was, I had always been a pretty creative kid. And she knew that at least when we lived in Boston, like I was a lively student, I really enjoyed learning and being in the classroom and she could just see that I was unhappy. Like I was doing well mm -hmm. and I was getting good grades and if you know anyone in her community saw me, they'd be like, oh, she's doing so great. Like, why would you want to send her away? Um, but I think my mom knew that like there, that I wanted more 
out of learning and that I want yeah. more from the world, I guess. I, I really often felt like the bubble that I was in while I was in Seoul was too small and I wanted more like diverse perspectives. Um, so I also have a couple of questions. Is it all right if I just ask oh, a few yeah, questions now? I, I want to hear the rest of the story too, but I just, my curiosity is uh, getting the better of me. So I think I'm, there's maybe two questions and you can answer both or one or whatever you want. But um, so I guess one is on, I guess, valuing education mm -hmm. and sort of um, in your family, was education something that was talked about a lot? Like, was there a conversation about that? Or like, education is very important. It's important that you go to college. It's important that you get this, this kind of big degree you know, at every stage we wanted to prioritize, you know, education. Was that like an explicit conversation or just assumed or not that important? Like, I'm just curious about the dynamics mm -hmm. around that. Um, Cause I know that that varies a lot and yeah. sort of what the family views are yeah. towards education, not only are sort of different across families, but can really then shape the choices that are made about your education. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and as you mentioned, there's also the factor of like, you could really value, value education, but the financial situation might not allow pursuing a certain type of education. Okay, so that's one question. Mm -hmm. The other question is about language, which I'm a language nerd, so I just have to ask about this. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you mentioned at first going back to Korea and not having um, like the confidence in Korean, but then how did that change? And you know, what steps did you take to um, learn Korean better? And what was that transition like? And yeah, do you feel still like more comfortable in English or whatever? It, I just have to ask another language nerd. So if you want to answer that, you can. But no, no, no worries if. If you'd rather just stick to one of the two. Yeah, I'd be happy to answer both. Uh, to your first question, yeah, going to college, being well educated was never something that was questioned in my family. Uh, both of my parents uh, went to college, yeah, and like did post grad stuff as well. Um, so it was always known that I was probably going to go to college. Uh, and I think my dad had a bit more of a holistic view on education. He really valued like finding the thing that you're interested in and doing what you love. Whereas at the time, at least my mom was more interested in doing, in me accomplishing things that would define me as more traditionally successful. Like she wanted me to be at the top of my class at school. She wanted me to be able to do well on the Korean college entrance exam. She wanted me, and if I did that, like she wanted me to be able to go to like the Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Korea. Um, so she was very big on that. And I would say like, that was a lot of pressure. Um, and as for the language part, I honestly don't remember how I picked up Korean. Cause I feel like when you're eight, nine, like your brain is still pretty squishy. Like as long as you're in the environment, you pick things up pretty quickly. Um, but my parents do have some funny stories about like the earlier days of me acclimating to Korean school. Um, apparently there was a social science exam where one of the questions was, uh, what is a Korean national treasure that is nearest to your home? And I wrote a crosswalk because that was the latest word that I had learned that was more than two syllables. Oh, and then you put down crosswalk as the answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there are times when I like would come home with a 20 out of 100 on a math exam because I just didn't understand the questions and I would come home smiling because I at least didn't get a zero that time. But yeah, I'm, I don't have a lot of memories between me not being able to comprehend anything and then me suddenly comprehending everything and doing well in school. So cool. sorry, I couldn't provide more no, I information don't. there. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah. Um, I remember one of the questions in our agenda was like, how did you find out about going to school abroad? Yeah. Um, and for the junior boarding part, I knew because of my cousin. And other than that, my mom and I kind of went in blind. We didn't know that the boarding school application process ran on like a different time cycle because the school year starts at a different time than in Korea. Um, and we didn't know that like you could go to these institutions where like these mentors and people you pay could help you apply to these places. Um, so we missed the cycle, we didn't know who to turn to. So I ended up going to whatever school in the Northeast was open and available for me at the time. I did not enjoy my it, time there. Oh, your first year. Mm -hmm. Oh, because you started um, Exeter as as a new lower. As a new lower. Yeah. New lower means second year. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. okay. Yeah. 
So for eighth and ninth grade, I went to this small junior boarding school in Connecticut, and that essentially set me up to apply to places like Exeter. Um, I'd applied to, I think, 12 to 14 different boarding schools. Um, Damn. Yeah. And That's a lot. Yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot. Uh, I remember writing a lot of essays and my dad being very invested in the essay writing process. Um, but yeah, by the time acceptances rolled in, um, I could pick from a handful of pretty good schools that I liked. Um, but in the end, I chose Exeter because I liked that it had the Harkness system, the the round table system that Keanu and Thomas talked about. Uh, I mostly, you know, shat on it, but anyways, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, at the time, I was wide-eyed and bushy-tailed. I was like, yeah. oh, this is different and cool, and I don't know, I may have an individual individuality complex, so I was like, I want to be different from other people. Um, so, yeah, I, I chose Exeter not knowing how difficult the next three years would be. Um, mm. And then, yeah, that was that. Uh, well, I mean, thanks for the story. I mean, Thomas, I, I wonder if you have any questions about that. I mean, I have, I have one for you, Andy, so I'm going to throw one at you. So it seems like 12 and 14 is a lot for somebody who just kind of like blindly entered the process. So, I mean, how did you feel throughout the process? Like, as you applied to these schools, did you want to go more and more? Like, towards the end of it, you were like, oh, I definitely want to go? Or like, towards the end of it, we were like, were you like, uh, this is kind of exhausting. I don't know if I'm actually like, really want to do this, like, sort of. Because I think I was sort of more on the left. Mm. Yeah, personally, but yeah. I think for me, like getting out of the Korean education system was such a huge goal mm. that I was definitely working overtime for a 13 year old. Um, I was just so excited. I, I couldn't stop working. Looking back, I'm like, that was probably unhealthy. Um, but at the time, yeah, I was just really excited. I wanted to see which schools I would get into. Um, it was a big adrenaline rush. I don't know if either, but maybe both of you want to answer this question. Um, if you like remember specifically like what you talked about in your application, like just for context, it's kind of crazy. It's like you're, you're applying, it's like applying to colleges, but you're applying to high school. You have to do an essay and you have to do a whole standardized test and you have to do an interview usually. Um, and of course you have, so like your opinions there, you might have a lot of opinions, but they're going to change a lot. So yeah. you, what, what you say in your essay, what you say in your interview might be totally different than what you say in college applications or grad school applications and all that. Um, and of course, some of it might also be driven by your family or your parents. Like, I think it's pretty typical for there to be a lot of family involvement in these essays, mm -hmm. which is kind of weird because it's supposed to be something that's reflecting you as an individual. Mm -hmm. And yet there's this ability for these adults to really enter the process and shape what you're saying and how you're pitching yourself, which is kind of weird. And I remember like, you know, my parents read over my essays and stuff, although I kind of resisted a little and wanted you know, wanted to direct the flow of it myself. So I wonder if you guys remember, like, what did you write an essay about? Or what did you, was there something you said in an interview when applying at age 13, 14, that still sticks out to you? I might need a moment. Yeah, my man, I barely remember what I, what, what I say yesterday. So I, this is a while ago, right? I mean, this is what, 2010 for me? Um, I do remember the interview processes because my parents traveled around with me when I was, you know, visiting these schools and doing the interviews. And my parents would always ask me after these interviews, like, oh, how did it go? Like, what did they ask you? Right. Um, I actually do really, <laughs> funny enough, I actually, I think my best interview experience was not with Exeter, but, but, but a different school. It was actually with Andover. So I totally thought I was going to get it, but I didn't get it. But anyways, uh, not, not important. But, but they talked about the, my Exeter interviewer talked about like, oh, like, what do you think about like, if you were in a parallel universe, if you were like a boy, if you were like a same age kid, uh, same everything, but born in North Korea, like how would you feel about like, yeah, it was something along the lines of that. And I think I had like a very like, I don't know, in my, in my own mind, like a smart answer. So, I mean, I think you liked it, but that was like the only memorable part. In terms of the essays, I mean, like my parents couldn't read over my essays. Like, you know, my parents don't really speak English. So it's like, I don't know, I kind of like wrote stuff and then I think I submitted. Um, I remember, I know I'm going off a little tangent, I'll, I'll, this is, you know, Andy, this episode is for you, so I'll stop, I'll stop talking, but one thing that I do remember is the SSAT test, a standardized test for the, so for the listeners, say it's, it's the um, information, it's the, um, the SAT version for these high schools, 
and it was so hard. And I remember I was just like, man, I'm like, I'm like, I don't know, I'm a middle school student in Korea. Like, I'm not gonna learn these like crazy hard like verbal, like these these archaic words that I've never even heard about. I'm like trying to like like learn English, you know? Um, so yeah, I just remember that as that's that's one thing. But please, Angie. I totally forgot about that test until you yeah. brought it up. But yeah. yeah, that was a hellscape. Would not recommend to yeah. anyone. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was exactly like studying for the SATs, but when yeah. you're much younger. Mm -hmm. um, I actually don't really remember what I wrote in my essay. Um, I think it was, you know, some generic stuff, like what leadership positions I had in middle school, mm -hmm. uh, my hobbies, like what I enjoyed doing. I think for one of them, I like wrote about my relationship with my sister. Um, and yeah, there was a lot of uh, control on my parents' end there. There was some censorship going on and I was like, you know what? You can't stop me from submitting what I want to <laughs> submit. I'm gonna submit the things that I think best portray mm. who I am. Um, and it is wild that your interviewer asked you what yeah, it was such a wild question. That's why I remember it, right? That's why it's so memorable and I still remember it, right? And my mom was like, oh, that's weird. And I was like, yeah, no weird. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was weird, yeah. I mean, we can bleep this out, but do you mind me asking who your interviewer was, if you remember? Oh, I had no idea. Mm. It was like a very old, I, I think he's probably, you know, retired and he's not actually like one of the faculty. And even at that point, the interviewers tend to be like not like the, the full-time faculty that are on like at that time right they're mostly retired faculty now i mean i might be wrong I, please at least for me the interviewer was like an alumnus it's not i think usually, oh, really? like, they like recruit like alumni volunteers oh. who like live near you uh i mean because they're not going to fly out like a uh, teacher to like interview you interesting oh i don't wait, know how it was for you did but you, you had an on-campus interview no, no i did it no oh, oh you did yeah, it during, no, visit. Did oh. during my visit oh okay yeah. no i did it in tokyo with uh, like a exeter alum who lived uh, that's different but, um, okay, I guess, I guess, yeah, it's probably a different situation. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. What about you? Oh, me? Yeah, ask the question you gotta answer. Okay, me. okay, yeah, I saying I gotta ask, uh, answer the question that I asked. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I remember one essay, at least. I think this was my Exeter essay. And I think it was about why I liked dark movies. Mm. Um, so, like, at that age, I think for, like, a 13-year-old, I... Probably had a pretty dark and disturbing <laughs> taste in movies. My favorite movie at that age, still one of my favorites, is a movie called Seven with Morgan Freeman and Brad Pitt um, and Kevin uh, Spacey. What's in the Box. What's in the Box, what's in the box? Yeah. exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. you guys know. Uh, oh my gosh, I love that movie. When I was 12, 13, I still love that movie. When you uh, were 12? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and you know, it wasn't just that. It was a lot of movies with these sort of dark, disturbing themes. Mm -hmm. Not in like a, oh, I like horror movies kind of way, but what I wrote in an essay, I think, is how these dark movies reflect a certain, you know, sort of like a film noir, like mm -hmm. capturing the underbelly of society. Mm -hmm not shying away from what's difficult or traumatic or okay this is maybe me projecting backwards onto what i wrote um, but i think I, I was saying something about how it's like a useful form of social commentary that if you're just everything's like a rom-com or just a straightforward action movie where the good guys win that's you know a little formulaic it's a little boring whereas you know so seven for context it's about a serial killer who kills people in the style of the seven deadly sins so you know i think the first one is gluttony yep. and he makes someone basically eat food until they burst and die um, and you know there's like um you know each sin he picks someone so who kind of embodies that and then kills them in this sort of dante-esque way that like really captures or is appropriate for their particular vice mm -hmm. um and you know the it's interesting because you know you have this you don't sympathize with the killer but you also see that what he's trying to do is point out all these like vices in society and what's wrong and then at the end, it's not really like, okay, I'm not going to spoil anything, but it's not like a typical ending for a movie where you like <laughs> are left feeling good and like the good guys won and everything. It's, it's a lot more morally ambiguous. Yeah. So I talked about that in, in the best way I could for a 13-year-old. Um, but that's, I, I remember that because I still, like, I still like dark movies, but anyway, that's my answer. <laughs> Born different. <laughs> yeah, born different. Truly, like I, my <laughs> them, Kihong at thirteen and Thomas at thirteen were clearly very, you know, on a different, you know, spectrum of intellectual, uh, I don't know, capacity. So I, yeah. If anything, uh, man, that's crazy. You wrote about the seven. Okay. Well, um, yes. So Andy, after this arduous process, you clearly got in and you chose Exeter. 
And then let's let's just you know rewind the clocks back to the first day of school, right? Your parents dropped you off. Um, what dorm were you in? Yeah. Okay. Let me let me think back to that. Yeah, time. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, wow, it's like almost ten years ago. Um, okay, so first day, yeah, I brought all my stuff. I remember like having bedding that I had had at the previous school, some books, a stuffed animal. Um, my parents, I think, were more excited than me. I think they were very proud, um, and I was just like, yeah, this is just my next step in life, like, I'm here. And by then, I had already done two years of, like, packing and unpacking my life to start school. Um, so I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna sit here and unpack stuff and then go to an orientation. <laughs> I was pretty nonplussed about it all. Um, I was assigned to McConnell, which I really appreciated. I really oh, liked- Oh, McConnell. Mm -hmm. Um, I really liked all the girls in my dorm, and there were a few girls in my dorm who were also new sophomores. Um, so I mostly hung out with them that first week, and they uh, remained good friends with me until the end of school. So, I wish I kept in better touch with them. If they're listening, I don't know, I'll shoot you an email. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, I was assigned to McConnell, I think because the school... I think Exeter had an impression based on my application that I was a sporty person only because the junior boarding school I went to mandated that everyone take a sport. So I was horrible at soccer, but I somehow remained on the soccer team until ninth grade. And I think because of that, Exeter was like, oh, like we'll put her in the, in the dorm that's like in between the dining hall and the gym and she'll make friends with the guys that are the jocks, I guess, in the dorm across. It's not sporty at all. They totally misread me. Um, they, so McConnell had a lot of athletes. Mm -hmm. I remember a lot of the seniors in my dorm at the time were on the rowing team. Um, yeah, I think a few members played squash, squash and volleyball. Yeah, so I would say relatively sporty dorm for a smaller dorm. To say. And you said that you have a group of you had a group of close a uh, couple of people that you stayed friends with throughout your time at Hector, right? So I mean, looking back, I think we we talk about this a little bit, but I I, th I think it's it's actually we, we tend to sort of take that for granted. I mean, I had that in habit, so I I sort of had this tendency to take it for granted. But it's actually kind of a hit or miss, right? A lot of people don't really find the the click until the moment they graduate, right? So I mean. Uh, from your personal experience, from what you see around in your, you know, with your, amongst your friends, right? Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, yeah, I definitely had some friends who wanted to move dorms at one point. I remember there was like this really bureaucratic application process you had to go through if you wanted to switch dorms right. during your time at right. Exeter. But I remember hearing from some friends that they were having trouble making friends or yeah, maintaining friendships with the girls in their dorms. Um, but yeah. I guess I really did take that for granted, that I had people in my dorm that I liked and got along with well, enjoyed talking to in the common room after school. Um, but yeah, if you do decide to go to Exeter, I would highly recommend McConnell. The girls in that dorm are very sweet, very nice people. Yeah. Love it. Um, just maybe as a comment or question, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that last point is interesting because it's like, you know, obviously it's been a while since we've been there, so it's a totally different group of people, but there is this sense in which the culture outlasts the individuals. And so yeah. I feel like it is possible to make not necessarily generalizations, but to, to, you know, assume certain cultural artifacts that remain in a dorm long after you've, you know, been a part of it. And even after there's been a complete turnover many times mm -hmm. of the people who live there. Right. And so like, for example, at my dorm, you know, there'd be alumni coming back and they would be like, Oh yeah, I was in this dorm like 10 years ago. Do you still play this game? Do you still do this? And, and of course, they, they did all those traditions like passed on. And so there is this kind of interesting phenomenon of like the people are totally different, but things linger and stay on. Um, yeah, which obviously is not limited to, to boarding school. This, this happens a lot in different kinds of institutions, but it is a little microcosm. And I think, um, yeah, it's like one of those interesting features that, you know, creates a certain mystique and, mm -hmm. you know, almost this like nostalgia. You have people who are like, way older who are still super invested in their like boarding school community and I think the boarding school also tries to foster that because it, it increases alumni engagement and donations and all of that you know there is this this idea of wanting to capture and preserve that mystique and that nostalgia but you know, anyway that's my comment.
Yeah, whenever people do ask me, like, what was boarding school like? Was it like Hogwarts? Um, hmm. That's when I tell them that, like, each dorm or, like, house kind of had a character to them, which, like, like Thomas said, might not be the exact same as it was when we were there, but they kind of group kids together based on who they think will get along best. So it seems like your your life in McConnell, at least the social life in McConnell, uh, was pretty good, right? So would love for you to you know just tell us, share with us a little bit about you know life outside of dorm, you know classes. What was the rest of Exeter like for you, and how was the transition? Mm. I'd say my transition was pretty tough because I didn't know what I was getting into really, and I think I bit off more than I could chew. So. Uh, I don't know if this was your guys' experience because you guys both started as first years, right? But I had to be placed and tested into the courses I was going to take before coming. So I remember taking a test for math and for language. Um, and I placed into sort of like intermediate accelerated courses for both. So I entered into this math course called T3X, which was notorious for being difficult and being taught by like a rather frightening and very brilliant teacher. Um, Mr. Fung? Yes. Oh. Yes. <laughs> um, and I like, heard that and I was like, oh, how scary could this teacher be? Um, I've survived teachers in Korea. Like, I totally got this in the bag. I did not. I did not have it in the bag. Um, yeah, he's just built different, you know? He's, <laughs> he's too scary. He's so scary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that was the first time in a really long time that I entered into the classroom and realized that I was probably the dumbest person in the room. And that, I, that really shattered my ego. Um, and same with my other classes. Um, I think I just was dealt a difficult hand that year because I had placed into a Latin course that was also intermediate and accelerated with also a teacher who was known to play favorites at times and to be a little snarky to her students. Um, so that was not my best introduction to the classes department. Um, and then we had to rotate through different sciences each year. Like you had to fulfill biology, chemistry, and physics at least one year of each. And I believe in your senior year, you could choose what you liked and take an AP course or what was equivalent to an AP course for us. Um, and my first course that I got assigned was biology with Chisholm. So I had the trifecta of difficult courses, my very first uh, term. The first term, term, right? Yeah. yeah. So like the three out of five classes that I was going to on a daily basis, I would come out of it, I would come out of them feeling like I didn't belong. I was like, why, why did they accept me? <laughs> like I clearly don't belong here. Um, and I think that was when a lot of the the problems and the mental illnesses that I had, like the symptoms were starting to manifest because I feel like I'd always had those symptoms, but they really started to show up during puberty. So all of that hit at the same time. And before I knew it, like my junior year, I was trying to do assignments for class, like reading books, like the articles that we were assigned. And I would not be able to comprehend what was going on. Like I would be reading the same paragraph over and over, not comprehending anything. So, yeah, from my lower year onward, it was a slippery slope into feeling like an academic failure. Um, but on the plus side, I did gain a lot in my community. Um, within my dorm, I think you might know her. Her name is Megan Doe. Uh, she's in their year. Uh, she's a really good friend of mine, and she actually helped me join the yearbook, Pian. Because um, I had originally wanted to join as a photographer. Uh, yeah, I do remember you and Pian. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, and she was like, actually, I think you'd be better fitted for the layout team. And I didn't know what that was at the time. But she taught me how to use InDesign. I learned how to use Photoshop. And mm -hmm. that was where I spent a lot of my time outside of the dorm. It was like a very quiet place that I felt like I could just do my little creative thing, feel like myself again. And yeah. I think the term that I joined, I also auditioned for a few acapella groups. Um, so my first term, I was in, in Essence and PADS. And then eventually, I, uh, for context, In Essence is an all girls acapella group, one of many. And PADS was like the one co ed acapella group that we had on campus. Uh, eventually, I just picked one, ended up joining PADS. Um, and yeah, th 
those two activities were my main sources of community, even though I was feeling kind of out of place academically. Well, let me make a quick comment, and Thomas, I'm sure, I'm sure you have one too, so I'll, I'll hand it over to you, but around the, the whole accelerated course thing, the placement thing, uh, uh, just, just trying to remind myself of the logistics around it, if you'd wanted, you could have asked to have been, you know, placed in a, in a different level, right, even for the same subjects, right, so even for, because I remember I, I, how in lower year, or lower year, upper year, now it's really escaping me, but uh, the chemistry, I took the accelerated chemistry course, and I was struggling a lot with that one, but looking back, I mean, there was no reason for me to do, you know, I wasn't even a STEM major in college, you know, like, looking back, there was no really, you know, like, a concrete reason to go for the accelerated track, but it's kind of like, Back then, I don't know, for me at least, it felt like it was kind of like the cool thing to do. So, uh, yeah, it, uh, what's, how does that actually work? Right? You could have been placed out of those, right? Exactly. Um, eventually, I was placed out of the T3X accelerated track. Yeah, I think yeah, there was yeah. a course you took after that, but I was like, no, I'm not going to do it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But I wish I had known before arriving at school that it was an option to not take that recommendation from the school. I thought because I was placed into it, I just should do it. And if I don't do it, then I'm a quote unquote failure. Like I had very strict ideas of what it meant to be a successful and happy student. And it was a very small box that I put myself into. Um, yeah, and I don't think my parents really knew that was an option either. They were like, oh, you took the placement test, you placed into this class, you should take it. Um, but yeah, had I known, I probably would have out of it. Yeah, I think that this is super interesting because the experience you end up having is so dependent on sort of like these different tracks you get on and like what courses you decide to take, what language you decide to take. Like I know you, you said you took Latin and like, you know, I think like classics was like a pretty big deal in terms of, yeah. you know, there was a whole classics diploma or something. Or like you could wear this like laurel wreath if you like took yeah. classics for like all four years or something. Yeah. Um, and then I think that attracted a certain group of per like a certain type of person who's like, you know, pretty competitive. I didn't do Latin. I ended up doing Latin in college, but uh, my sister did Latin in, in high school. Um, and I definitely noticed that like it, it, the people who did that tended to be like, you know, tough, smart people who are also, I think, a little hard on themselves. Very and, intense. Yeah. Like, you know, what you were describing of like, oh, I got to do the hardest possible thing. I can't, I'll be a failure if I, if I drop down and choose something easier. Like that, that mentality I think is, is, is very prevalent in boarding school. And you know, if you're if you take a certain type of class, you're even more likely to be in classes with that type of person, which can then be even more like not it's not anyone's fault, but this sort of group effect of everyone acting like that can be tough. You know, like in my case, I think I I, uh, I, I took as my language I did Russian, which ended up becoming like a very like defining interest. And I went through and I spent a summer in Russia and all this stuff. So I talked about it extensively in my college interviews. So that ended up being a good choice, but it was not like an extremely hard class or anything. And, it wasn't anything like what I heard from friends who were taking Latin or Greek where they had so much homework and yeah. super uber competitive and the teachers were like grilling them. And it, it was not a, a, like a super strenuous experience in that sense. Uh, even though like as a language, it's like pretty hard. Um, yeah, and then like math also, like I think like I did not start in T3X or any of these like accelerated math classes. So I sort of had like a more gentle ramp up of just like the first term math felt very like reasonable, like, like even easy and then I could kind of just like I, I ended up like skipping a level over the summer by like doing like independent work and stuff like that so I could kind of start in with a more moderate level and then like work my way up instead of being like slammed in my very first yeah. term you know yeah. um, and so like I feel for that because it's so like I think my experience would have been totally different if I had taken like a different combination of classes and had surrounded myself with a slightly different group of people I think it ended up becoming hard and you know you, you flip around between different friend groups to get different academic cir circles like there are certain people that you end up with in classes over and over again there's certain people that you never take a class with you know i'm talking about like classmates and all of these like factors go into i think creating the atmosphere 100%. and like how much stress you experience and how much pressure you put on yourself and yeah i know I, you know there was some conversation about this from you know academic advisors dorm faculty of like okay guidance on what courses to take but ultimately they're not an expert on your you know, needs on what's healthy for you and they're advising other students. So yeah, maybe there wasn't like enough or the right amount of like guidance on how to appropriately structure your schedule. And there's always that fear that, you know, if the teacher says, okay, well, why don't you take the easier class? 
than what you were saying of like, well, no, 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 you have your internal pressure to mm -hmm. like not be quote unquote a failure mm -hmm. uh, and all of that. So I think, you know, students were pretty hard on themselves and mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know, like I would definitely like, I don't know if, you know, go back in time and tell people like, you don't have to take like the hardest course. I think it's more important to explore different things and then find the things that really, you know, really connect and click and like make you excited to learn and not just like you're doing it because you feel like that's what success is. Right. Um, anyway, yeah. No, thank you for that, Thomas. And I know, I know, Andy, before uh, we started recording, I know I, I want to sort of uh, build on this point uh, around faculty that Thomas just mentioned. And I know that you have some thoughts, so please, please let us know uh, how helpful I observe faculty, you know, um, full, uh, members were, you know, for you when you were going through stuff like this, were they helpful, were they not? You know, tell us a little bit, yeah. Um, it's still like two-pronged, right? Like, I didn't know that I was allowed to ask for help. Um, I'd never, aside from like the formative years I spent in Boston, like I, it had been a really long time since I had teachers who would maybe even be open to giving help to students that needed it. Um, and in the case of my first term teachers, they were all pretty, uh, they were big on tough love. Um, and I remember really struggling with that bio class and not once did that teacher ever pull me aside and tell me, I really see that you're struggling. Like, is there anything that I can do to help? Or like, is there anything that you need help with? Like, there's no mention of that. Like, even in my midterm evaluation, he just wrote something like, oh, she's clearly struggling. She needs to start reading the books more thoroughly. Really? Yeah, and that was like, and, and that was pretty much like my end of year evaluation as well from this teacher. Um, so there was no intervention. And same for my advisor. So for some context, at Exeter. I'm pretty sure it's like this at a lot of other boarding schools. Your dorm faculty was also your academic advisor. Like you would be assigned to this academic advisor and like it wouldn't necessarily be someone who is catered to your interests. So I think I had a dorm fac who was a little bit hands off. Um, she was fun to be around. She was nice, but she definitely didn't uh, embody the whole thing that boarding schools advertise is like oh our faculty are in loco parentis like they're in place of parents they'll take really good like attentive care of your kids no that's not possible these dorm back have to take care of like 20 kids at a time but even then like she knew that i was struggling academically and we never once sat down to have a conversation about it like she was just like oh she's struggling i think she asked me about it maybe once and i told her yeah i'm feeling really stressed and I feel like my parents are putting a lot of pressure on me to do well, and I don't know what I can do about that. And this is where I mentioned to Kihong in our email previously that I feel like at such a diverse and international environment like these boarding schools, there needs to be proper DEI training. Because if you've had a lot of Asian students before, whether that's like first gen or second gen, you know, probably these kids don't have the easiest time telling their parents that they're struggling academically. 100%. Yeah. Um, but I'm guessing this teacher had not considered that because promptly after we had that conversation, she called up my mother and said, your daughter just told me that you're putting a lot of pressure on her and I think oh you should gosh. stop doing that. Which yeah. resulted in my mother calling the dorm telephone and I got very heavily reprimanded I'm sure. for telling on my mother um and that was when i was like oh gee like it i think my first reaction was like oh like this is just another example of why i can't trust other adults to help me like i felt weirdly betrayed by my advisor yeah and also uh like a few years after that i was like oh that happened because this faculty just like didn't understand the different cultural nuances and how parental relationships can differ in different cultures Hundred percent. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing. I mean, that's that's something that I, I didn't personally experience any of those, and it's it's not something. And I and I think I was just very lucky with my dorm, you know, faculty and advisor. So I mean, that's something that you know has never you know, came across my mind as like a potential problem that you know, um, you know, uh, students of minority can run into in boarding schools. That's that's so. Thank you for sharing that. Um, great, great, great. Um, so. I mean, you told you told us a little bit um, before recording, kind of like the the highs and lows of Exeter. It sounds like there were things that worked out nicely for you, but there were things that could have been better. 
Um, just curious, I mean, is there anything else that's like very memorable as, you know, like kind of like a source of big stress beyond just academics, beyond just kind of like surviving um, and things like that? Uh, I would say academics was probably the biggest source of stress. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really grateful that I had a not very stressful social life. I had my small mm -hmm. group of friends that I really liked. I remember really enjoying that time period between uh, the end of assembly and like the start of your next class where everyone would just migrate to Weatherall and yeah, 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 eat yeah. cereal and have an extra cup of coffee. <laughs> like those were some of my favorite moments because even though we didn't have assigned tables, like everyone knew that like if you sat with your dorm, you always sat at the same table and it just kind of felt like a little family snack. And I think of that very fondly still. All right, great. Well, um, so how was, so I mean, we, we, Thomas and I discussed this a little bit in our own boarding school episode, but I'm curious, and this wasn't in um, our original list of questions, so um, just, just letting you know, but how was sort of the next steps phase of Exeter like? So the, what I mean by that is just like the college admissions process, like, I mean, do, do you think Exeter sort of gave you more clarity on what you want after it, or do you feel like you came out of it a little more confused than before? Ooh, I definitely came out of it more confused. Because um, coming into Exeter, I had thought I was a, a strong student in STEM. Like, that is how I pitched myself in the application process to Exeter. Um, and then because of that first term, because I struggled so much in all my classes, I no longer thought that I was a student strong in STEM, which turned out not to be true in college. Like, I found my love for math and, and science again. Um, but yeah, the college admission process was very confusing and very stressful because I had already been struggling academically. I think I only graduated maybe with a B average, which looking back is not that bad. No, it's great. Yeah, 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 yeah. it's like perfectly average. It's normal. But at the time, I had so many peers and especially other Korean peers in my class who were really excelling, like had A minus, A averages. So I was feeling like a failure. And I knew that I couldn't apply to like the top tier schools that my parents had expected me to go to coming out of Exeter. Um, so yeah, I came out of it definitely feeling more confused. Uh, on the flip side of that though, because I was also spending a lot of energy on my hobbies. Like for PIADS, I spent a lot of time arranging and composing music. Um, my senior year, I finally entered the concert choir, which is life-changing for me. I feel like that really helped getting to start every morning. Like my first period was choir. So I would start every morning singing and like having a good time and it really set the tone for my day. And same with the yearbook. I feel like that was a hobby that I would have never developed and it's still something that I tap into. Like whether it's like setting up cameras or like taking photos of myself and putting them on Instagram or like writing an arrangement, uh, writing and arranging like sort of blog posts, which like is related to the work I do now even. Um, so weirdly my interest outside of academics helped kind of form what I would end up doing past college even. And I mean, this could be a negative or a positive thing. I didn't end up going to any of the colleges that I wanted to. The school that I got into was actually my safety school. Um, but had I not struggled and had my advisor not recommended the school to be on my list, I would have never gone to Historic Lumens College and I would have never known that that was an option for me. And I would have never experienced that community, which turned out to be so healing and different from Exeter or even anything else that I had experienced. So that's the silver lining, I guess. No, no, no thank you for sharing. I feel like, I feel like there are some, there's some things that you, you brought up sort of kind of resonates deeply with me. I think it, it, I, 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 yeah, talk about this openly, uh, but I mean, I, as somebody who's, who, who openly admits that they struggled a lot at Exeter, I think in terms of, you know, for me, I think it was the social life as well, because uh, I didn't really have like a good, like, you know, group of friends beyond, you know, what I had in Abbott. Um, so, I mean, for me, the social life in college was like 100 times, 1000 times so much better. And just like for my mental health, it was also much better. Um, so we, we sort of, Thomas and I both talked about like, oh, like, you know, how did I sort of shape our experiences in college, whether in a good way or whether in a bad way? And um, we, you know, we discussed this before, so you know, thank you for sharing your experience, Andy. Um, do you have any comments?
Yeah, no, I think it's super interesting the way you transition from being a student who's just focused on getting the most out of your education in high school, mm -hmm. taking all these classes, doing all these activities, and then there's sort of a shift maybe like in your junior year of high school, mm -hmm. going into senior year where you start to think about college and it's quite stressful. And actually, looking back, like that's not a huge amount of time. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you've actually only really been a student for like two and a half years or so, and then suddenly like middle of junior year, and then it's like, boom, like, okay, college time, you know? And like two years, that's like not like a lot. I've been in grad school now for two and a half years. It certainly doesn't feel to me like, oh wow, I'm like fully formed in terms of what I want you know, after this. It's like flown by really. Um, and then also like the emphasis on, we talked about this a lot, like sort of the status on campus, these yeah. hierarchies, these ways of people using grades and extracurriculars, you know, labels. Things like, oh wow, that guy, that girl is such a beast because you know, try like a you know ten point six GPA. <laughs> he uses this bonkers eleven point scale where like an A is an eleven, A minus is a ten. So it's like, oh wow, if you have a right. ten point something, that means you're getting all like you know A's and A minuses. Yeah. Um, and like, and they're yeah, tri varsity athlete, yeah. and they're like a concert pianist. And they like, you know, did this crazy internship yeah. over the summer. They do mock trial. And they do mock trial. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So they do everything. They don't like, you know, they have complete mastery over all of their time and, you know, somehow manage Can't to still relate. be like nice people and, you know, <laughs> whatever. Like, it's, you know, like there is this quantifying or labeling of someone as being like Harvard material or something, yeah. which could be kind of toxic, even though it wasn't this kind of cruel system intentionally of like you suck because your grades are bad like i didn't hear people say that but i think it's it's almost more of a pervasive but kind of implicit way of talking about things sure, and yeah. hierarchical um and yeah what you mentioned about like finding these other hobbies and other things that you're spending so much time on mm -hmm. like it's hard to work that into the system because sometimes that all that effort doesn't feel like it's being rewarded or anything you right. want to be doing things that have like a payoff in terms of college acceptance mm -hmm. um and you know of course you can find ways to talk about your hobbies and turn them into you know essays and mm -hmm. extracurriculars and all of that mm -hmm. um and you know lots of people got involved in clubs and yeah. found hobbies and sports and all that in high school which i think is good um but yeah that sort of competitiveness or way of thinking about things in a kind of one-dimensional way i think it messed with my brain a lot you know just like the over like overly focusing on grades not enough on finding things that were important to you not enough on like finding like a good fit like a college where you can really thrive like i mean my thought process for like looking at colleges was like so looking back yeah so dumb it was just like okay like apply to places that are like prestigious and you know have like a large endowment per student and have like world-renowned you know programs and this or that even though i didn't really know what i wanted to do and you know i wasn't even asking the kinds of questions or like well will i be able to you know, join like a club or a community where I'll feel welcome, like kind of the things you were mentioning about um, the unexpected benefits of, of finding a community in, yeah. in college um, that, that you weren't necessarily anticipating ahead of time. Um, and, you know, that should all be part of the college counseling experience. Mm -hmm. Of course, I don't fault like an individual. I think like a lot of it is distributed, right? It's like on the group as a whole, you know, so being so, um, you know, anxiety inducing about this and of course, the college counselors are trying to make you happy and make your parents happy and make the administration happy because they want to have good mm -hmm. rankings and good, you know, all of this stuff is, mm -hmm. is happening. But um, yeah, just, I think for everyone to take a breath and just slow down and try to actually identify what do you want out of this experience? Like, what yeah, do you yeah, want out of going yeah. to college? Yeah. You know, what are the things that truly make you feel not just happy, not just successful, but like, like a thriving person who can integrate all these things together into yeah. a life that's like well lived, all of that. Um, can be kind of tough. I don't think I had enough of those conversations. Mm -hmm. I think too many of my conversations were about like posturing and trying to like, you know, like subtly, you know, flex, like, you know, um, you know, how my, yeah. my accomplishments or whatever, yeah. uh, obviously not all of them, but, um, there's a tendency yeah. to, to lean too much into that, which I now kind of regret, I think. So, yeah. yeah. I, I know I, I had, I had this tendency to sort of kind of like, let the, as the thoughts come to me, sort of say it in a, a, a bit of a haphazard manner, so I mean, uh, forgive me, Andy, but like one thing that just came across my mind is like, I feel like the one common theme throughout all of this is that like so much of it is driven by luck. And because there was just so much pressure, whether it be, I mean, Thomas called it, you know, it, it's, as, as he explained, it's like unspoken, but very like, very pervasive, yet implicit, 
all that stuff. It's like, I, I don't know, from such a young age, I feel like what I really got out of this experience of, of boarding school was kind of like how to posture myself exactly as Thomas said. And I love the word that you, you, you used there because it's like, I'm just so now good at just like putting a facade like in front of me in whatever situation that would just like kind of like hide and suppress all the anxiety and all of that. And I feel like even until very recently, I just didn't know how to sort of like embrace like the true self within me and just kind of like, I don't know if this is a great word choice, but just like forgive that, right? And just by like letting it, you know, be seen, be shown to others. Because, you know, until you do that, it means that you're not very happy with your true self, right? I mean, I came to this realization very recently, right? Not, not even until, you know, college. I think even throughout college, I sort of suppressed all that. But I don't know if you have thoughts around that, you know, because we talked a little bit about, you know, mental anxiety and all of that. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. How do I put this? I feel like, even though I didn't know how to verbalize those thoughts, I had always been someone who would go against the grain as a kid. It was obvious when I was in Korea, it was obvious when I was talking to my parents, um, and I think experiencing these kinds of failures, failures, hardships for the first time at a place like Exeter really made me face like, okay, now that this huge thing of like being good at school is no longer something that I can attribute to myself, what, what does it mean to be me? And I think I was thinking about a lot of those things at that age, and I think it's also what contributed to the massive anxiety that I had, because suddenly everything I knew about myself was no longer. Um, and to your point about like learning how to posture yourself in these environments, um, this is just a thought that I had more recently looking back. So, okay, at the risk of rambling and jumping across too many different things, so when I lived here as a child, I had this very idyllic memory of the United States being this like happy place where like I could learn and like be embraced by other people so easily. But when I started experiencing failure at Exeter and like seeing how teachers and other people reacted to me based on that, I realized that I only had the privileges of being accepted because I was traditionally successful as a child. Um, Entering into like American society and like very privileged American society again at a, a different age really made me see like, oh, this environment is actually really hard to survive in if you were not, for lack of a better word, bred to succeed mm -hmm. in yeah. this environment. Yeah. And it was the first time I really noticed my non-whiteness in white environments. Because mm -hmm. previously, even though I was like consistently the only Asian kid in the classroom, nobody ever made me feel other. Mm. because I was doing well. But once I started doing poorly, like, I would, oh, I don't want to, like, blast anyone, but I had a classmate in my dorm who, like, would come to me for help on her math homework, which I was happy to do, like, in the cases that I knew how to help her. But in the instances where I told her, like, oh, actually, I don't think I know how to do this, she would say, oh, I thought you would be good at this because you're Asian. Um, wild, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, so Exeter was really the first time that I realized, oh, I was not born and bred and prepared for this. Yeah. And to your point about seeing other students who seemingly very easily succeed at everything, like they're a tri varsity athlete, they have a 10.6 GPA, they have loads of friends, they're kind, they're well-liked, they're like student class president or whatever. The commonality between a lot of these students is that they either have parents who also went to Exeter or places like Exeter, or they had parents who were academically well-rounded or like very emotionally supportive, who knew like what could come if they sent their child to a place like Exeter. Um, I had classmates who would come back to the dorm after class like feeling sad about their physics grade because they got a C on their exam or something. And one of them would come back and tell me like, oh yeah, I talked to my dad about it. Like he also went here. And so when I told him I got to see and was really sad, he said it was okay as long as I tried my best. And he knows how hard that class is with that particular teacher. And I was like, wow, a wildly different experience from mine. Um, which I think, yeah, might nicely segue into like what we might want parents to know when they decide to send their child to institutions yes. like boarding school. Um, so like I previously mentioned, my mom and I went into this process really blindly. 
Um, we didn't really know what would come of selecting a school like Exeter, which had a very different curriculum, even against like other boarding schools. And I've had many conversations with my mom about like what could have been different had I chosen to go to any of the other schools that I got into. Because I'm guessing that those schools probably followed a more like study curriculum of like everyone advances in the same way. Everyone takes like an AP course their junior and senior year so that they're well prepared for like the college board AP exams. Like, like if I had more structure at school, maybe I would have gone to a better college. And we, my mom and I will go in circles around this because she, I think she still feels kind of sadly that despite going to a place as amazing as Exeter, I didn't like reap the benefits of it as much as I could have. Um, to that, I've been telling her, well, you and dad didn't really know what this society was like. Even though they were living and working here for almost 10 years, they never fully integrated into the society within Cambridge because they were only hanging out with other Asian academics, other Asian performers, other immigrants. So they never learned like what it's like to try to survive in a very privileged white environment. Um, so that kind of sums up. What I would like to say about international parents who are looking to send their kids abroad. Especially I think dorm advisors because I think this is kind of beyond the scope of what happens in the classroom and the interactions between the teacher and the student but it's more like how are these kids feeling outside of classes right when they're in their I guess you know their their comfort zone and their dorms I mean the, you know the students tend to be more open than I think one thing that dorm advisors can do a better job of at Exeter is just really their focus on just like students' mental health and just like checking in and just like, I think in retrospect, I mean like one thing, right, if they, if they were to truly play the role of replacing your parents, then they should be able to just come to you and just say everything's going to be okay, right, at the end of the day, you're going to be fine, right, um, and then I, 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 I talk about this a lot, but not every not every student sort of gets the um, the correct amount of appropriate amount of attention that they deserve. So um, thank you for sharing that, Andy. Um, great. I know that this episode was a little bit about boarding school and you know um, and all of that. I know that that was the purpose of, of this, but you know beyond that, we're also very invested in you know how your journey has been. You know, you know uh, since becoming an adult, I guess you know your career, your life. So. And it sounds like at Exeter, you sort of, you know, the silver lining was you found your interests, hobbies around, you know, you know the, the video editing, like content creating and all of that. I know that you also had a couple of YouTube videos, right? Um, and, and you made in college, is that correct? Maybe? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so tell us a little bit about that, right? How's your journey been? You know, uh, what, what excites you about 2024 and all of that? Oh, yeah. So even after boarding school, it was kind of a long-winded process to find, like, a job that I like and a job that I feel like best utilizes my skills. Because mm -hmm. um, even when I got to college, I couldn't escape the the rat race of like I gotta do what's like traditionally successful. Yeah, yeah. I like major in chemistry because I thought I was gonna do pre med because again I was like kind of pressured into it. And then I ended up not even ever using my chemistry degree. Um, and then I went to business school because I was like I don't know what I'm doing with my life. So I did like a one year program where mm -hmm. they taught me like basic accounting, like basic finances, operations, stuff like that. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And then I got in touch with Megan again, uh, who uh, was working at an edutech startup. Um, she was like, hey, I, there's a job opening here. I know you're like a decent writer. Do you want to send me some samples? So I started working there. So that was my entry into creating learning content, for lack of a better way to put it. And then that kind of led me into technical writing, which is essentially just uh, taking STEM material and turning it into non-STEM language so that people who don't have a background in science or technology or software can understand you know, what they're using and why they're using it. Um, so yeah, looking back, the hobbies that I partook in at Exeter really laid the foundations for the things I enjoy doing now. Mm -hmm. And things I'm looking forward to in 2024, uh, some work projects. I don't know if I'm allowed. I, I think I should be allowed to say this. Um, I've been assigned like 
to do some research on SEO. I've never done that before. Oh, wow. Um, so I'm excited to learn how to do that. Yeah, heck yes. Um, and yeah, my friend and I have been like brainstorming together to throw a cocktail party. So now I'm like getting to, uh, you know, use my InDesign skills again and like make a little menu. Um, yeah, so those are the things I'm excited for this year. I love it. I love it. Uh, this was our last question of our, our own boarding school episode, but if you were to have kids and, or just recommend it to, you know, you know kid, your friends around that has, you know, um, kids that are about to go to school, high school, would you recommend boarding school or would you not? Tough question. Yeah. I get asked this question pretty often and every time my answer is it depends on your kid. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It depends on your kid. Yeah. And I would say give them the option. Like if you have the means and like the background to send your child to an institution like a prep school um, and, you know, they're academically gifted and they like school, I would present the idea to them around like age 11, 12. Like, hey, this is something that exists. And if they want to, sure. But I would also give them like a heavy, heavy, like, precursor to like this is what you're getting it to i just need yeah, to yeah, know yeah, that yeah. but sure if they want to mm. is that is that in line with oh. will, we, will we discuss what did we say i i said i don't think i'm gonna send mine but yeah i think i said something similar to andy said yeah, yeah. that definitely like i'm not i don't remember fully so yeah, i yeah. might be yeah. caught with yeah. saying something different i don't know but that, that i agree with what you just said i think it aligns with what we were talking about in our previous episode yeah. about parenting which you know we talked about how it's so important to recognize the individuality yeah. of your kid like that is a person like you can't just project all of your exactly. expectations onto them right. you can't live vicariously through them you know like mm-hmm. as you mentioned a lot of kids at boarding school have parents that went to boarding school you know it's not just an opportunity for you to like send your kid there and relive your youth and you know have them follow in your footsteps and all of that like mm-hmm. sure that might make you feel nice but as you said it depends on the kid like yeah. the person that kid is a person that kid is an individual who has their own personality who has their own academic interests who has their own hopes and dreams um and it's not the right choice for everyone mm-hmm. and if you do do it as you were saying you know you want to keep i think clear and open communication both before during and after during, during. Um, about how it's going how to manage all of the you know, potential sources of stress, the pain points, um, all the pitfalls, the culture of it, which is so different, I think, than um, just regular high school where you're still living with your family and you yeah. see each other a lot more often. Um, you know, that, that especially if you're international or on the other side of the world and 12 hours ahead, and it's really actually hard to stay, stay keep communicating clearly, right? Yeah. You, just being proactive rather than reactive about those kinds of situations, I think is, yeah, super important. So I, I totally agree with your answer. I forget what I said um, in our episode. Uh, you probably said that. Yeah, you probably said the same thing. Yeah. Uh, just to add to that, what I just thought of was um, I would also make sure to tell my kid, like, you can quit whenever you want to. Yes. Like, you can go for a year, and if you decide this is not for me, I want to go on medical leave, or I just want to quit altogether, that is completely fine. Like, something I wish I could go back and tell, like, my 13, 14 year old self is like, just because you started something difficult doesn't mean that you always have to see it through. Like, there's no reason to put yourself through so much unnecessary pain for success. Like, if you're meant to do something, it will find its way back to you eventually. 100%. Amen. Amen. Love it, Andy. Well, I, I think Thomas and I tried our best jobs to cover everything that we talked about before starting recording. Is there anything that we glossed over we missed uh, that you want to sort of take this chance to elaborate more on? Please let us know. I think we touched on everything. Yeah, this okay. was a very thorough uh, podcast interview. So thank yeah. you for being such I mean, a nice host. Yeah, how did you find the experience? I mean, did you find it therapeutic? I mean, is this, is this good? Or uh, give us honest feedback, you know? Yeah, I mean, it was nice to have an audience who gets it, right? Because yeah, yeah. I can have these conversations with people who haven't gone to boarding school or, like, kind of idolize boarding schools in a certain way because, you know, I feel like boarding schools are written a lot about like in fictional material sure. and people think like oh it's like this fun beautiful place where teenagers get to hang out and not have adult supervision but yeah i think it was really nice to have candid conversation about our experiences yeah. love it well it was a pleasure to have you on i mean thomas any final words um, 
no, just yeah, likewise. I think um, always great to hear from someone who has experiences that are both similar but different, yeah, and that, that sort of tension and interaction of like yeah. comparing and contrasting and sharing. For me, it's therapeutic. I hope, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. it was very good. I hope the audience yeah. enjoys it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just like reflecting on, like I, I like how different themes that we've talked about in our conversations, things we talked about offline, end up finding their way back in. You know, not just about boarding school, but really we're talking about something I think broader than boarding school. Yeah. It's about you know your journey of getting to where you are, finding ways to process how you got there. You know, as we find ourselves in this current state where we're. Mm -hmm now adults, but still figuring things out, figuring out life, um, you know, just looking back, I think is helpful in terms of also looking forward, um, finding the story, the narrative that can explain and make sense of um, the different things that have happened to you and, you know, experiences, positive and negative. Um, and yeah, I think like high school, boarding school being that place where you were first away from parents, first, you know, um, making uh, some of these friendships, exploring these things, it's, it is a really, I think, important and formative time in your life. Um, a lot of like really new experiences, but also tough ones. So um, yeah, I, I certainly um, have gained a lot from talking about it with you and hearing, hearing your thoughts. So thanks, Andy. Thank you. Yeah. Please have me over again. I'd love to come back. Yeah, yeah, please. I, saw, I was just going to say, so please uh, feel free to reach out to us, revisit us if you want to talk about any other topics you want to impart your wisdom on. Um, we had a session on you, know, you telling us about how to like video edit, you know, I don't know, maybe be a content creator. Uh, but anyways, um, uh, thank you again, Andy, for coming on as a guest. And uh, for the listeners, we will come back next week with a new topic. Actually, I think I will be gone starting next week for a little bit. And I've heard that you have a surprise guest. Surprise guest. Surprise guest, right? So, um, yeah, so uh, stay tuned, everyone, <laughs> and we'll see you next week. Bye. Cool. Yeah. All right. Whew.